And so moving on to the next part of uh, our demo day, we have with us Mr. Salum Avid, the CEO of SSC Capital, Ashwin Ravichandran, the Managing Director of Mest Africa, and Ajay Ramasubramaniam, co-founder and CEO of Startup Rezo, who will be here talking about driving startup investments in Tanzania. Over to you, Ajay. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jagruti, for running us through the, the pitches. Uh, I'd like to now welcome uh, Ashwin and uh, Salum on, on screen. Uh, we're going to have a, a very short fireside chat and with 12 startups having pitched, I think the, the very obvious or straightforward uh, point is how do we drive startup investments in uh, Tanzania? So uh, coming to coming to the point uh, direct, we have with us uh, one gentleman who is an investor and another gentleman who for the past several years has been uh, working with early stage companies, running programs across different parts of Africa. So no, be no two better people to take questions on, on this front. So welcome on, on stage, uh, Ashwin and, and Salum. I'll, I'll dive right in. I'll dive right in. So Salum is based in, in Dar es Salaam. So more close to a lot of people uh, in the room and in the founders especially. Ashwin is based in Ghana, but at the same time running programs in different parts of the the continent so very much aware of uh, early stage tech ecosystem so uh, salum i'll go with you on the first one what do you think is missing in uh, tanzania's startup investment ecosystem and do you see a role for corporates and dfis to to play in in nurturing and taking it to a next level uh, thanks ajay and thanks for having me uh yeah so what what is really missing in the market as as we speaking now is I'll speak from uh, both ends, from the demand and the supply side. So from the demand side, actually, we still uh, have few struggles to build the right companies uh, that you can take to the market and be investor ready. Uh, so we understand the role that hubs and accelerators play in programs such as yours to bring more companies to, to, to the market. As we may know, uh, just take an example of uh, VC investments in any part of the world. The, 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 the ratio is usually 100 to one. A VC investor look at 100 companies before they make an investment in one company. Uh, so that tells you that you need to have a bigger and bigger pool of companies before you make an investment. So if you wanna make 10 investments uh, in a year in one country, and then you need to have uh, hundreds of companies that you can look at, which I think is still a struggle uh, for, for, for Tanzania in that particular sense. Uh, but on the, on, the, on the supply side, the major challenge that we have actually is largely uh, missing of early stage investment options. Uh, majority of investments that you see in the market is, tends to look at deals from series A and above. So series A, anything from a million dollars and above. Uh, that leaves out majority of, uh, of startups that are struggling to raise very small tickets. So if someone is raising $50,000 today uh, in anything up to half a million, it's a huge, huge struggle I can tell for a fact uh, to raise that kind of money. Because the, the fact is uh, raising money for early stage uh, startups is usually the work of local investors. This is not the space for foreign investors. And local investors for this, for, for this sense is usually angel investors. Uh, a space which you've been struggling to build for the past three years. Uh, so you, we need to have uh, a much bigger uh, pool of angel investors who would provide small tickets, de-risk some of these startups and build them as a pipeline for you know, uh, a series A investment from VCs. And of course, the role of uh, DFIs and corporates is critical. Uh, as we may know, uh, if you were to, to build alternative funds to traditional VCs and traditional angel investors is to have the micro VC funds. Uh, that probably a fund of size, say, of a million to, to $10 million, small fund. And this type of fund is very, very challenging to raise if you are to go into traditional markets. Uh, because we all know that 65% of all uh, funds that are being invested into VC funds across Africa come from North America and Europe. So raising a million dollars uh, for that kind of fund in such markets is almost uh, non-commercially viable. So these type of funds have to be formed locally. So you have to set the small fund here. Uh, so who would fund these funds? Uh, so we still have pension funds which are still shying away from uh, the small micro venture capital funds as an, as an asset class. So that's where DFIs can come in and provide small tickets 
to set up these small funds, even for first time fund managers, because it's just another struggle. You may want to, to set up a small fund here, I'll say for a million or $2 million. If you go out to raise money, if you, this is your first fund, again, it's another struggle for you to raise, to raise money. So DFIs, because they use different sorts of funds, unlike say pension funds uh, or high net worth individuals or family offices, they can, they can do that by providing this type of money for first time fund managers to invest in these early stage businesses. So the likes of IFC, uh, CDC, which of course I understand they still play a huge role uh, in investing in, in, in majority of VC funds. Corporates uh, on the flip side of it have a very uh, critical role to play. And, and guess what, it's different actually, uh, because with corporates, if they were to invest in a startup, they have uh, double edge so, sort of returns. They, they, they get financial returns in the investment whenever they see an exit. Uh, but at the same time, they also have an addition to this, their corporate strategy, uh, uh, you know, uh, diversification. So let's say a bank today invests in a Mipango app, uh, for that matter. Uh, their services are probably, uh, say, a bank in Tanzania, a commercial bank who wants to, to, to design that kind of a product or services and launch to the market. It usually takes much longer time. It usually takes much more money for a corporate to decide on a product or service to launch to the market and the amount of money they spend on marketing. So instead of doing that, they could easily invest in a company such as Mipango and take some stake in that business, which has a team already who have probably developed the model already, and then they could invest in this company and cut off the time that they would have spent if they were to do it internally. So one is, this will add up to their, their customer base. They can, they can penetrate into more markets. They can go into new markets. Uh, but at the same time, they, can also have, they also have some stake. So in case they exit that investment, they can also add up uh, additional income to their PL. So I think corporates can play a huge role from banks to uh, telcos, uh, you know, to all other major, uh, to insurance companies and all that. Because I tell you, in, 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 in many parts of the world, Corporates spend up 10% of their, of their annual budget in R&D. Uh, and, and I tell you, that's, it's a lot of money. Uh, they can only use a fraction of that to invest in a startup. Uh, and then they can see the upside in a shorter period of time. Uh, and then guess what? Uh, they can build uh, a portfolio of, of small scale companies, which you have seen Safaricom is actually doing that in Kenya. Uh, so they can do that. So all the banks can do that here. They don't have to spend a lot of money. They already spend a lot of money on things which probably don't have any value uh, on you know, CSR and that kind of stuff. They can use almost the same budget and invest in companies which make a lot of sense uh, for them, for the, for, for the market. And I think they can help to grow the investment ecosystem in Tanzania. That's, that's a straight shooting from the hips, but very, very succinct and, and very appropriate kind of uh, points. I mean, in terms of you have people, you have ideas, there are problems to be solved. Yes, there's mobile phone penetration, there's technology to be built and, and solve problems, but how do you go about kind of bringing in the, the money in the, in the early stage ecosystem, which is a challenge in, in all emerging markets. And, and to the point on, on corporates and the double-edged sword, I guess we have seen this in, in a market like India as well in the last uh, five years, where initially there was no belief or people were thinking that, hey, small startup, what is it going to kind of really bring to me? But I guess corporates catching on to the bandwagon is a, is a major thing. But I will pick uh, Ashwin on one point that you made uh, initially, Salam, and talking about uh, create, creating an ecosystem for uh, angel investments or angel investors and that you've been trying to, to build in, in Tanzania for the past few years, like you said. So Ashwin, I mean, you have been solving one problem which uh, Salum spoke about, which is about uh, creating a pathway for uh, folks who are early in their journey, a uh, mess through a structured program, you're doing the funneling, you're, uh, you're providing them with the skill sets and wherewithal to, to go out there and, and build a product. You're also kind of providing them with the early seed capital. But uh, when it comes to kind of their ability to actually go and raise follow on financing, and I'm not saying follow on financing down the road, but also after that seed capital, they have an MVP, they have a beta version that goes out. Uh, what have you seen from a broader African context and also the work that you've been doing in East Africa in terms of uh, the, the success rate or what are the, the routes that uh, startups are taking to go out and, and raise that money, which allows them to actually build for a little bit of scale? Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, Salam, uh, thanks a lot for, I think, uh, your your perspective as well. And <clears throat> though I think wholeheartedly, I do agree with your perspective. I think it's now, I think investors need to start changing what we keep saying about these things, but, you know, like that, you know, it's really hard. And um, 
again, I, I, I think now as investors, we need to be more empathetic. So I think that to, to take your line, Ajay, which is I think the most single, most critical thing over here is one of the biggest things we've realized, and again, we're not just, we're not just early stage uh, growth ecosystem programs. We put money where our mouth is and we put 100K into our companies as well. So in that case, what we've realized is companies which truly realize their market potential every single day and can actually quanti- make it more quantitative rather than qualitative. Like I've spoken about four, uh, four companies through this program. None of them were able to give me a, a, a figure value. And again, I don't think it has to be accurate, but it has to resemble what is actually the potential of this, the solution, right? And thereby what we saw, what we've seen in East Africa is, because East Africa is also part of an ecosystem which is slightly developed, not because of its own nature, but because of its neighbors. So when you look at countries like Kenya and Rwanda and Uganda, there is a lot of, I think, funding going on there. Again, is it VC funding? Is it donor funding, DFI funding? There is a dime a dozen, right? But I think where we are at with Tanzania, yes, we've seen, I think, Mascot Foundation come in. We've seen a few USA projects, et cetera. But still to see actual funding come out is a little hard. But the two, I think the first most important thing for actually criticalness for success is basically um, market potential. I think that's the most single critical thing, which is that how much is your market actually worth if you're actually running the solution in the market? That's number one. Number two, what I've really, really realized is a massive differentiator right now in East Africa is a talent. How important is your team? Because gone are the days where single founders could raise checks. Now, uh, every VC and every angel who's coming in wants to see at least two people sweating it out as much as they can. So having a team in place and understanding what is actually required for that team is also helping. Okay, so uh, Ashwin, I'll go with the the next question to you. So, and because you have seen uh, a little bit more on the on the West Africa side, and whether you look at uh, companies like the Paystacks of the world, or probably if you look at companies like Flutterwave, uh, these are kind of poster childs of what's happening in in Africa. The success stories, their ability to raise rounds of financing, get acquired, and and so on and so forth. But when you take a, a step back and you have the, the folks doing the hard yards, the two people sitting in a, in a shed, in a garage, building out something, probably getting into programs like MESC, getting access to that early capital, the first 50, 100K or whatever. But when it comes to the, the real money, which is more of the, the VC money or the, the bigger chunks. Now, from our early conversations with a bunch of folks, and you're one of the earliest guys that we spoke to in Africa, I mean, going back to to July last year. But after that, I mean, speaking to some of the folks in Tanzania, one of the things that we heard from people running accelerators and uh, in the early stage ecosystem was that for anyone to come in, you need to look at alternative modes of uh, getting in. You cannot look at the, the cap table model. If you're an investor, you want to put money into early stage companies, you got to look at alternate models, which probably might be a share in profits, uh, probably it is uh, kind of revenue-based financing and things like that. So from your experience, is does this work in the African context broadly? Or is this something that you would advocate to your companies or companies in your portfolio to, to look at? It works anywhere in the world. At the end of the day, a startup is a business at the end of the day. The term venture capital has been designed by a bunch of, uh, for the lack of a better word, well-educated, well, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, I think well padded in the in their pockets, you know. But at the end of the day, debt has been the, the king of the game since, I think, like decades and decades and millennia. I think even like if I would go comfortably say it's centuries, centuries of business. I'll be really honest. I think debt is actually a really sustainable way of growing business. Obviously, one of the biggest challenges in Africa is the interest rate, right? Like they go, okay, you have to give me 3% per month. Boss, are you serious? Versus actually like, hey, can you actually give me a 7% loan across the year? We'll actually get this across. So alternative, oh, okay, let's let's first talk about it. So venture capital, is it a need versus is it, is it a want? I think it's a want, right? Because venture capital comes at the risk that your share price of your company is going to grow, go, it go up if you actually invest in my company, plus you give me cash to actually run the business. So see, what actually works in, in Africa and what I've realized works is um, family and friends. They're your biggest investors. <laughs> like 
if you really need to beg and borrow, my first company, my dad, my uncle, and my grand uncle actually invested it. They put at that time a thousand dollars worth in Indian rupees, which at that time was a lot of money, uh, into that business. When we started off, three people, we had to pay ourselves salaries for three months, etc. Uh, that is a part of an investment which you can get easily, right? The second part of which is alternate financing, which again a lot of people are talking about right now, is debt. Go find a person, give, ask them to give you a loan, etc. The third thing which everyone talks about right now, which is really popular on the, on the, on the continent is grant funding. Obviously that takes a lot of time and a company needs to have a lot of structure, governance before they, act, they can actually take a grant. Like you can't just start a company tomorrow and go apply for a grant at UNICEF. UNICEF will be like, please go away. So the alternate routes of funding, we've always advised our companies to choose the least path of resistance. We don't tell them to actually go forward and put them through the whole, you know, uh, I think the journey and the stress of raising money, it's extremely competitive. And when Solomon was saying that you need to go to a thousand companies to invest in 10 companies, it's actually, the numbers are even more skewed. Like I go through close to about I think 180 odd ideas before I choose five to invest in. So the ratio over there is so skewed. So at the end of the day, I completely agree that yes, venture capital is so much risk, et cetera. But again, as an entrepreneur, you have to choose the least, least path of resistance for you to survive your business, eat, as well as make sure your customers feel the value every single day. Whether that comes through debt, friends and family, whatever, you need to figure it out. Venture capital cannot be the only solution on the continent. And again, I, I am one of those people who does venture capital, but I can come from it. It takes a lot to get to that stage. <laughs> Salom, I'll flip this over to you and make you wear an investor's hat who has been seeing a bunch of companies around you and how the ecosystem has kind of uh, matured over the years. As an investor, do you think that by whether venture capital route or whether it is debt financing, revenue based, whatever the modern terms are, as an investor, do you believe uh, the return on capital or even getting back your money is something that can happen with the kind of ecosystem that exists right now or the kind of deals that you see right now in Tanzania? It's tough, uh, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's tough. That's why uh, even look at, uh, at this, the data in terms of how many VCs actually make money uh, is, is, is a thread uh, of all VCs that you see in the market. So it's a tough place, a place to make money. Uh, that's why uh, you, you'd see you know, the, the ratio is skewed because you, you try to minimize as much as you can the risk of, of failure, even though you cannot eliminate uh, all, in, all on it together. So it's, it's a tough space. That's why I, I believe we need to use as, as many uh, instruments as we can. Uh, and we should not just copy and paste the traditional models that we have seen uh, operating in the market for the past years. Uh, so if you look at VC model, for instance, uh, so the traditional VC model would simply go and do equity. Uh, until recent with the Y Combinator trying to bring up, you know, the keys instruments and then the safe instruments and all that. By the end of the day, uh, it's either equity or debt. Uh, and, and to me, I think it really also depends on the type of a company and the vertical where the company operates. Because some businesses are very cash flow, uh, are very strong uh, with cash flows, uh, very liquid. For me, I think I would rather use debt in such type of a transaction because it's easy for you to start saying, uh, you know, this company start generating cash flows for you. Uh, and for companies which you probably take a longer time to pay attention to the market, you know, build users, build value, uh, and of course, acquire the market share uh, that was, was said here. Uh, I think you can, you may want to use equity as well because it's more long term and more patient and for that matter. So I think it, it, it really depends on a case by case basis. So we should not have uh, the mindset of if I'm setting up a fund, I'm going to use only these two instruments. Mm -hmm. This is a diverse of uh, that you can use. Even within that, uh, we, for us now, we're trying to, especially in the angel network, we are currently looking at four deals and we are trying to explore some Islamic finance instruments because, you know, you, you spoke about sharing revenue. Uh, because that puts the company under pressure. Uh, every single dollar that comes in, you know, someone has to take a portion of that. Uh, so for us, we are trying to say, no, don't look at re revenue. Uh, we can look at profit. So we are not taking our dividends as such, but we can took, we can we can, we can look at the at the portion of the profits that the company can can give out without, of course, limiting its growth in the in, in the years to come. So we can look at all these type of, of of instruments which we think can be not only friendly to the type of the business that you are investing in. 
uh, but can also give you a little, you know, not to lose money uh, on the table by investing recklessly. Uh, so you cannot just uh, rule out the, the, the traditional VC models because the way they've been structured, the way they've been designed is to see, this is risk capital. You're trying to minimize risk as much as you can. Uh, the only thing I would say is just use multiple instruments. And on top of that, we have seen donors for many years trying to provide grants to the market. And, and in some places, I would say partially grant has, has, has made some change, uh, so some changes and in some impact to, to some, some guys who have benefited from the, from the grant. But majority of entrepreneurs can tell for a fact, actually have simply become grantpreneurs. So they, they really look into their models, they redesign their models to fit into the donor's criteria for them to access a grant. Which to me, I think, instead of doing that, uh, donors can work with commercial investors and de-risk some of these investments and build some blended financing instruments that we can use to invest in these companies. So if I cannot put my hundred thousand dollars in this company because I've had earned this money and then say, guess what? The, the donor says we'll put probably 50% uh, of that as a first guarantee to your equity loss if you can invest in this company. Or maybe I'll provide money for the for, for first round of this business until it is, it's cash flow positive, and then you can come on board for follow-on financing. So I think we can use a mix of all these instruments to a way that I believe uh, we, we, can, we, we don't put a lot of pressure uh, to a startup because we all know VCs put a lot of pressure on the founder. Uh, but at the same time, you can also uh, protect your investments and at least uh, make a good return at the end of the day. Cool. Ashwin, I'll come to you with the, the next one. So, I mean, you've been in, in business for a while as, as MEST and you yourself, I mean, having spent the years that you have in, in, in Africa and, and doing different programs. And from your experience, uh, what, do you, what do you feel enablers like us can do to increase uh, access to capital for startups? I mean, yes, I mean, you can have accelerator programs but at the end of the program, you're getting some seed money. But for uh, actually helping them run the race, what, what are the certain things that uh, we can bring to the table? I think the biggest thing which you need to bring to the table is investor education, not startup education. <laughs> like we have actually gone away from educating startups completely about how the deal flow should be. We've actually started now focusing on investors and actually spending time with them, explain to them how deal flow should be. Uh, so in, um, again, um, uh, in, in a few circles, which, you know, uh, I, I usually have friends with right now, we, we say this term called uh, founder empathy. Mm -hmm. which is that every investor should have founder empathy, should be able to understand. But what is one of the biggest things which founders forget is actually investor empathy. Because see, you need to understand this, that investors at the end of the day are not investing most probably their cash. They're investing someone else's cash. They're mostly re responsible and if not accountable for that money. So while it is your duty to explain the problem and solution, it is also your duty to explain financial diligence, what the deal actually offers to them, and what happens if the idea goes completely, you know, ground, like completely falls down. Interestingly, we we're also trying to explain this to the investors as well, especially, you know, investors coming in from Europe and uh, in the US, when they come to us, they ask us, Ash, I want to invest in startups. And they're like, so cool about it. Can you get the valuations, et cetera? It's really hard to find those numbers because there's a lack of data on the content. So what we often end up doing over here is we end up sitting alongside the investor, uh, explaining to them, helping them understand the startup a lot better. So like I said, Investor education is probably the most critical piece of the game right now. Cool. So uh, I'll just continue on that one and uh, I'll just flip it a little bit for you, Salom. I mean, with your initiatives under the, the Angel Network and Investor Education, what is your, your I'm, I'm sure there are like good number of people in, in Tanzania who, who have uh, interest in, in alternate asset classes. They might be potential to, to invest or start investing in, in startups as an asset class and beyond just the money it might be smart money uh, they might be able to kind of provide the kind of networks that allow companies to grow what has your experience been with uh, educating the the investors and making them look at startups like hey this this also can help me make money in the longer run and i can tell you that's one of the toughest jobs uh uh, I've ever done when it comes to educating the investors to look at uh, startups as an asset class. Because what we, I can tell you one thing, we have uh, around 17 members to the network. 
And 80, 70 to 80% of these people have made money in traditional businesses, in traditional industries. These people have made money in traditional real estate. They've made money in, in, in logistics and transportation. They've made money in trading, uh, going to China, buy yeah. stuff, coming up. Uh, and these are the kind of people that they say, you know what, maybe we can uh, also try to, you know, for them, they thought probably investing in, in, in startups is much more as, a, you know, buying stocks in, in, uh, in a listed, corporate listed company uh, and, and, and use it as a passive income, uh, which, which is, is totally opposite to that. So uh, trying to educate to them that, you know what, when you're investing in a startup, first of all, you can lose all of your money. Uh, you can invest in 10 companies and all these 10 companies can fail. Uh, so this one thing that you need to understand. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, the challenge that we have been facing when you talk to them is the, uh, their involvement into this company. So initially, of course, I think we were desperate. So we're setting up uh, these people based on their uh, you know, high net worth and the experience that they've been in the business for a couple of years. But you, you come to learn that it's not just about investing uh, in, in putting in money into a startup. You also need to provide mentorship and coaching and all these networks for them to grow. Uh, and then, of course, that's where the challenge is uh, because they don't want to be involved with, that, with such things. Just want to put money into the startup and then they want you to do that, which, of course, you know, loses, it loses all the whole meaning of being an angel investor, uh, especially at the early stage. And, of course, some, uh, again, uh, will ask you, uh, you know, give us five startups in Tanzania that people invested in five years ago and probably there are two or three exits that we have seen in the market, which again, uh, is another challenge that they don't, they don't understand that we, we are building these industries from the ground up uh, and these initiatives are only a few years old. So we have to be in this together to build this industry and probably we can have that track record if you are part of that. So you need to be part of this, of this journey. So you don't just want to you know, sit aside and then probably see what Saloom is trying to do with other uh, few dudes. And then probably if, if, if we invest in one or two companies that we've seen today, and then probably we've seen some exit in the next seven, eight years, that's when you want to jump on board. So you say, you know, you want to be part of this. If we fail, we fail together. If we win, we win together. So the, those are the challenges. You know, they are, they are so used to traditional assets. They're so used to, you know, just investing and sit, and, 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 and sit aside and then wait for, for returns. Uh, some, of course, are short-term investors. They want to invest in a company. I can give you one, one example. That one of the members is invested in, in six different companies, not startups. Mm -hmm. uh, where he, he, he now just lives off dividends. So he retired early and then he just gets his dividends every year. Uh, enough for him to, you know, pay for whatever lifestyle that he's living. Uh, and this guy, you tell him, you know what, we invest in startups and then we, dividends is not visible for now. Let's build this company uh, and let's see how it grows. Uh, and then they, they don't understand the language. So it's been a struggle, uh, which again, I always believe that uh, as long as there's a potential, uh, all these struggles are worthwhile to go through. So this is the type of challenges that we face and the, the role that we are trying to do. Of course, we share some uh, uh, cases, what is happening in Nigeria, probably mm. with, with Paystack, you know, some exit that we have seen, uh, you know, opportunities in, the, uh, in, in other markets where corporates have acquired early stage businesses. Uh, and then some tend to understand. So we have decided, you know what, we have less expectations in investing and then we want to spend more time in education. So we want to spend the, especially for this year, for the rest of the months, we want to spend more time. You want to put more pressure to them to invest. We want to, we want to educate them more. Uh, we want to bring in more other investors. So this year we have a few programs to bring in other angel investors from other parts of the world, within Africa actually, uh, yeah. whether it's from Egypt or whether from Nigeria, just to talk to them and tell them, you know, what their experiences and, 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 and what they've seen in the market. So challenges are there, especially to, to, to talk to them to, 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 to change their whole thinking and look at startups as an asset class. But at the same time, of course, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of work that still needs to be done. The focus now is education yeah. rather than investing. Interesting, you mentioned Egypt. I think uh, in the last week or 10 days, there are like three nice big venture funds that have been uh, set up for, for MENA region and, and all headquartered in, in Egypt. But also, I mean, uh, funny that you mentioned the people who have made uh, money th through traditional businesses. I mean, if you go back four or five years, even in India, there were a couple of uh, angel networks, which largely had folks who had made their money in real estate. Now, real estate is a great business to be in in India. I mean, it gives you anywhere, uh, the, the IRR is between 18 to 36%. And these guys would think that startups are the same. They would put in money six months down the road. They would be knocking with goons at the door asking that, hey, when is my money coming back? And startups would be like, what money? How does it come back in six months? And people would then forcefully kind of try to, to get get the startups to return their money and, and whatnot. And there have been like horror stories. So yeah, I guess investor education and, and getting them to understand how this beast startups work. And you got to kind of 
have skin in the game and and be in it for those seven or eight years to to actually start seeing the first handful of exits. I guess it it requires a lot of time, perseverance, and and effort to get people to to part with their hard-earned money, but also understand that how this this game works. So yeah. Uh, so Salam, I mean, just to wrap up things, I'll come to you with the the last question. Uh, with with the leadership. Ship change uh, in the in the country due to unforeseen circumstances and unfortunate circumstances. Uh, you're already seeing that there are some some changes happening when it when it comes to the policy making and, and opening up of the economy. How, how do you see impacting uh, startups in the country and also attracting investments into into startups in the country? Uh, so I think uh, the two things that we need to to look at. One is. Uh, the government tends to look at the whole business environment in its totality, unfortunately. And that's the one thing that we have seen in the country, that uh, if, if the government is, is, is talking about simplifying the investment process into the country, they don't understand that uh, the way investors invest in startups is not the same way uh, Nestle will come and set up a factory in Tanzania. It's not the same way. Uh, the type of challenges they face are different. The type of demands are different. So uh, one thing that probably we want to see in, uh, if, with the new leadership is to uh, reclassify, uh, you know, the topic of business environment. Because at the end of the day, of course, everything comes down to the business environment. If the ease of doing business is 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 is, is uh, more easier in the, in the market, uh, people can easily start a company. People can easily invest. People can easily exit. People can easily, uh, you know, transfer their money out. Uh, you know, investors are protected in case of any downsides. Uh, you know, in case, uh, you know, they have to, to go to, to court, then commercial courts can execute these cases as quick as they can. Uh, you know, all these things, and then the tax, of course, the tax regime is as friendly as it can get. You will see more investments coming to the country, but you can end up driving more FEIs, uh, the traditional investments, rather than investments into the portfolio companies. So we want, uh, the, what we want to see is the government really trying to you know, reg provide specific uh, legal and regulatory framework for this type of businesses. And of course, we don't have to think much about that because we already have the, uh, the Startup Act, which of course was, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, Mest may have a different experience with that. Uh, so we have seen Tunisia already doing the Startup Act. Uh, we've seen Senegal. I've read the, the Startup Act of Tunisia, and I think it's an interesting piece of legislation if we were to deploy it. Uh, Kenya's working on it as we speak. Rwanda is working on it as we speak. Uh, Ghana, I think they, they must, whether they have or they're they are finalizing it. So because the Startup Act is the specific legislation for the startup ecosystem. Uh, everyone who was involved in that, in, that, in that industry. So that's what one thing we want to see. So if the government was to do one thing uh, for the startup ecosystem and drive more investments into startups, just build one regulatory framework for startups. And Startup Act can be one of those. And of course, you don't have to copy and paste everything that's happening in other African markets. We can still customize it, but at least it touches upon all the eight pillars of the uh, strong ecosystem that you can build in any market. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salam, for, for those. Ashwin, any closing remarks that you want to make uh, in general, how to improve or what can be done to kind of attract more capital into the country? Oh, I think you guys should just keep working hard. Uh, we invested our first uh, ticket last year, so we're very excited that we now have a footprint in uh, Tanzania. And uh, obviously, I, I will be there hopefully soon uh, if COVID-19 doesn't prevent it. But yeah, I think Tanzania is a good market. Um, we're still trying to figure out what markets and the numbers obviously behind those markets. The company we invested in is an agritech company, but it's uh, you know I think it's a it's a small market, but I think it's a very valuable market, especially because there's so many diaspora and as, especially because the base of Tanzania is still based in a lot of tourism. So there is a lot of exchange possible either through capital or through resources which I think both are very healthy to have for the ecosystem. But yeah, I think that's it. Great. So I think I'm, I'm done with uh, my question. Thank you so much, uh, Salom and Ashwin, for, for taking time and, and being here and, and patiently taking all these questions. So thank you so much for your, for your input. There have been some wonderful comments that I saw in the, in the chat window, uh, acknowledging and, and talking about some of the, the points that you raised. So thank you so much for being wonderful co-panelists. Jaguti, over to you, back again. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Salam, Ashwin, and Ajay for the beautiful session. I hope it was insightful for everyone in the room. And moving ahead and not taking much of your time coming to the uh, 
the most awaited part of the demo day, I would like to invite on stage, uh, on screen, Abdi Mohammed, the Managing Director and CEO of APSA Bank Tanzania Limited to announce the winners of the Wazo Challenge uh, Tanzania 2021. Thank you, Jagruti. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see me and hear me? Yes, Abdi, we can see you and hear you as well. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, normally this is where the drums would be rolling. Um, um, but before I go into the final announcement of the, of the winners, uh, maybe just to acknowledge, you know, the incredible amount of work that has gone into this. Um, you know, although my session is now, I joined much earlier and I had most of the pitches that were done. And, uh, you know, entrepreneurship at its core is about problem solving. And, uh, you know, I saw a lot of problem resolution or addressing themselves to problems that are real in the market, not just in Tanzania, but in many of the African markets, you know, education, health, um, waste management, um, the disabled, you know, and how to help them through some of the issues. So I think it covers the whole range and uh, the pictures were all amazing, I would say. And, uh, you know, with this type of thing, there'll be three winners that we'll announce, but that is winners of the pitches. At the end of the day, what really matters and the true prize is keeping the faith and pushing on to a point where, you know, you can attract capital that really takes the business to, to the next level. So I want to thank all the uh, presenters. And this last session, you know, with uh, Ashwin and Salom, has been particularly educative, you know, educational for me. Um, you know, I'm a traditional banker. We look at uh, ventures and, and enterprise with the banker's lens. And it was very, very good to hear uh, the other side of the story and the complexity of trying to invest in an environment where, uh, you know, there are thousands of different ideas that you have to work through. So that, that session was really an educational one for me personally. Um, so without further ado, let me uh, go to the announcements. Um, of course, this was done by a panel um, and, you know, there was a clear formal process that was followed to arrive at the final three names that are getting the, the prize money. And uh, I wish to start with the third uh, prize coming in at $2,000. Uh, it was won by uh, MedPak. So the MedPak uh, won the third, uh, third prize at $2,000. Well done and uh, wonderful, wonderful job. The oh, second- guys, we, we don't have drum rolls, but people can hoot and they can clap for them. <laughs> oh. There you go. Well done, well done, well done, Matt Park. The, the second one, um, which came in at uh, 3,000 uh, award, is the Mipango app, uh, the savings, uh, solution that was presented by Mipango app, uh, you know, very close to our heart as bankers. Um, and the first prize winner, $5,000, is Ikoba app. Another fintech uh, solution and uh, really addressing itself, you know, to a financial inclusion, which is a very important agenda. So, very, very well very done. Good. And congratulations, everybody. Uh, but as I said, you know, um, this is not about win, stroke, lose. It's win, stroke, win, because everybody who has participated in this has, uh, has received and will continue to receive mentoring, guidance, support, and there'll be many more opportunities for us to work together. But I'm really, really pleased uh, to have participated in this. And, uh, you know, as I said before, Ajay, I just want to assure you that APSA will continue 
to be a partner in this and to make sure that uh, we land this in Tanzania and also in the region as a whole. So thank you everybody and uh, back to you, um, Ajay. And thank you so much, Abdi, for your kind words and announcing the winners. Congratulations to all the winners, Kikoba, Mipango and Medpack. Over to you, Ajay, share your thoughts. No, I think uh, thank you, Abdi, for, for all the kind words and, and the support. I guess for us, uh, coming into the market, getting an anchor partner, so to say, I mean, keeping the, the, the sponsorship part or the, the monetary part apart, I guess uh, having the private sector involved uh, and who better than, than a bank and uh, a Pan-African bank at that to, to have as a logo and as a partner there, uh, involved in the program. It lends a lot of credibility, not just to us, but I'm sure that many of these startups, like you said, I mean, out of the three, uh, two of them, which are straight off uh, fintechs. And I guess, uh, I mean, fintechs can can continue to disrupt uh, consumerism in different ways, but uh, I think there's lots that they have to learn from a bank and a banker. So I think uh, while you have announced the winners today, and like you rightly said, there might be three winners of the of the cash prize, but I think the, the entire cohort and startups who would see this and would be a part of the journey, I think it is just a, a start for them and a start for, for us to continue supporting them, working with them and seeing how we can probably make uh, many of these companies uh, truly venture fundable, help them uh, not just raise money, but also importantly, how can we help some of these expand beyond the borders of Tanzania and become more of regional players or a, or a continental player. So, and, and with, with support and assurance of folks like yourself in your personal capacity as, as a banker, as, as a bank, I think that is really reassuring for, for us to kind of uh, continue in this wholeheartedly and keep pushing away, keep opening more doors, keep creating more opportunities. So, so thank you so much. And, uh, Congratulations, Hongera, to, to Kikoba, Mipango, and, and Medpack, and the, the other uh, nine companies as well. So all 12 of you are, are pretty much winners. I'm sure that uh, there are folks out here in the, in the audience who are interested in connecting with companies which are close to their hearts for certain topics or resonate with, with their business. So do not, do not mind uh, or do not uh, feel that you have lost out on the cash prize. I think it is much more and beyond that, uh, what programs like these offer. And it is an ongoing relationship and it is not that it was a four week venture bootcamp and we, we cut off after that. We continue working together. So congratulations to everyone and uh, congratulations to Kikoba, Mipango and Medpack on, on uh, getting awarded uh, some, some little money which will allow you to probably meet some small milestone in your, in your journey, which is for years to come. Over to you, Jagruti. Yeah, thank you so much, Ajay, for your uh, uh, kind words. Moving ahead, I would, like to, uh, I would like you to be on screen and take forward about the hindsight ventures that we launched today. Along with it, we launched two programs that we'll be announcing after, right after the hindsight ventures. Uh, so over to you, Ajay, to talk about yeah, hindsight ventures and talk, uh, walk uh, people through it. Sure, I'll, I'll keep this uh, real quick. People have been around for a couple of hours now. So uh, what is hindsight ventures and why hindsight ventures? So uh, this is a decision we took over a period of time. Uh, I mean, not that we don't like our own name, Startup Rezo, but more importantly, what we have seen in the last few weeks and few months of engaging with, uh, with, with Tanzania as a market, and then also at a broader level, looking at uh, the, the African tech startup ecosystem, where startups are at, what are the kind of companies being built? We felt that a lot of this is, is very similar in, in several aspects to where India was, where we are headquartered and having been in the startup ecosystem for the last uh, seven or eight years, what I have seen and what we as a team have seen uh, is that there are a lot of, uh, so they say hindsight is twenty twenty, and And what does uh, hindsight mean? Hindsight means perspective. Hindsight means based on experience. And we feel that the kind of perspectives that we bring from the previous years of seeing companies being built in India, the kind of experience that we have had is something that we can lend to startups in, in Africa to begin with Tanzania, uh, going on to East Africa and then the region and share or bring in those perspectives and knowing what works, what doesn't work, uh, what are the ways in which you can pivot a particular business model. So bringing in our, our experience or, or like the slide says, uh, reflecting upon what we have seen, how we have seen things evolve in India and kind of applying those to, to startups in, in the local market is something that we want to do. And that's the reason why we felt that 
for the entire African portfolio or African business that we intend to build over the next few years, we'll bucket all of that under under Hindsight Ventures, which will be a very Africa centric or Africa focused brand. To begin with, running programs like the Wazo Challenge and a couple of others that Jagruti and Paul will talk about. But uh, more interestingly, I guess the reason why we want to do this is because to some of the points that Salom, Ashwin, and the like spoke about, African countries have, have local problems, and these local problems cannot be solved by someone coming from somewhere else. They have to be solved by local entrepreneurs who are educated, who have access to technology, who bring in the requisite experience. And what we can bring as an operator is probably providing a platform, a platform which opens up uh, our network of mentors, network of corporate partners that we have in different countries, uh, bringing in expertise of different markets, and lending that to help you build strong companies for the local market. So that is what uh, all Hindsight Ventures is going to be about. To begin with, programs like the Wazo Challenge, the couple of others that uh, Jagrati and Paul will speak about, but eventually running full-fledged accelerators on the ground, and at some point in time, maybe later this year, early next year, start making those small ticket investments and being truly invested and vested in, in the region and, and the market. So that's what Hindsight Ventures is all about, and I'll hand it over back to you, uh, Jagrati and Paul. Thank you so much, Ajay. So moving ahead, uh, so obviously today we concluded the whole uh, Wazo Challenge Tanzania with the demo day. We don't, our engagement doesn't end here. We have two other programs for you, for the entrepreneurs there in Tanzania and in East Africa as a region. So first introducing the Founder Development Bootcamp. So basically this is a, a experiential learning program for the founders. It is a program for four days and uh, between which two modules will be introduced. Uh, in one of the module, you will be introduced to the design thinking and thinking about the problems, identifying that and validating your uh, problems through different uh, ways and understanding the business model. And second will be, uh, the second module will more focus on positioning your product in the market and how to position it in front of investors and customers. I would not like to deep dive more into it as uh, we have, uh, we are falling short of time. So I would like to, uh, go back to our website that I'll be uh, that I'll be sharing the link of, of after this session and you all can go ahead and visit the website and find out more information about both the programs and uh, the applications are live from now and you all can go and apply for the both the programs the second program that we are introducing is the East Africa fintech bootcamp this is a program to enable fintech fintech in East Africa so our plan is to identify 8 to 15 fast growing fintechs from the region and uh, uh, taking them through three weeks of uh, boot camp, where again they'll be introduced to various um, live sessions, workshops, one on one mentoring sessions, and to different industry experts who have already been there and built uh, a start of fintech startup in different markets. So there are mentors from a uh, global market and who will be coming uh, up and mentoring each of the startups to uh, build the idea or the startup they are working on. So I would like to invite on screen Paul, my colleague who is leading the Tanzania operations of Startup Rezo. So Paul, uh, I would like uh, for you to come on screen and share your perspective on both programs. Hey, yeah, so thank you Jagruti and thank you everyone for uh, spending your time for all the time that you've been uh, through uh, what has been happening. Uh, Again, to not waste uh, uh, much time, I'll go straight to the programs and why uh, we think these programs will be of great value to uh, startups and founders in Tanzania. Yeah, starting with, uh, with the FinTech Bootcamp. Uh, so the challenge has been uh, most uh, companies or most people venturing into uh, uh, FinTech uh, have been struggling first to build uh, uh, products that can uh, fit into the, uh, or products that can go into the enterprise level uh, and also fit into enterprise infrastructure, which is because as a startup, you have a great idea, you have uh, energy and you, you, you know where you want to go, but you don't have uh, infrastructures. So for uh, FinTech startups, most of them to grow, to scale, they need uh, enterprise infrastructure, but again, uh, most of the founders don't have even the ABCs of how to build products that will fit into those infrastructure. But again, uh, as you partner with uh, corporates, you also need to uh, cut up for their market and go for their targets. So how do you position your product to, to fit into that? But also, uh, again, uh, through this uh, program, you also get access to uh, 
uh, mentors who will help you uh, uh, to understand how to, you, to even to understand the market uh, potentials, uh, also how do you get a piece of that market, but also uh, the, the very key thing is that uh, with this program, you have access to global mentors who have been uh, founders of fintech, successful fintech companies themselves, but also uh, others are investors, investing in other companies. So you get to, to know the realities of uh, the, how to start and even run and scale a fintech uh, company. Uh, while on the founder development uh, uh, program, uh, in real sense, you, you don't get any formal education on how to become a, a great founder. And uh, the challenge with developing countries where we don't have as many examples to learn from, uh, we bring this program to help uh, aspiring founders or to help uh, first time founders to learn the, the best practices, to, to learn from the mistakes of those who have been through that journey, to understand the realities of the markets, uh, and to also understand even how do you uh, structure the operations and everything around uh, founding and running a successful company. Uh, and uh, the key thing in this program is that while most of other programs invest in, uh, in your product or invest in uh, what you're doing, uh, this program is more geared into investing in you as a founder because we believe you are the pillar of even the product and uh, the success of the company as well. Yeah, so. Uh, that's all about the programs. Uh, again, uh, the website will be shared and everyone is welcome to, to apply for the programs. Thank you so much, Paul, for your perspective. Uh, so you can reach out to me or Paul if you want to learn more about the programs. Even you can visit our website. The link is over here on the screen. Or you can find out the details about both the programs and apply there as the link is live from today. So uh, these are the handles, uh, our Instagram, the social media handles where you can find updates of all the programs that we run about all the latest live news, live updates about what we've been doing and what we are coming up with. So thank you everyone for staying for such a long time, listening to all the pitches and uh, I hope it was very uh, useful and uh, a good uh, time for you all to understand more about the Tanzanian startup ecosystem. Over to you, Ajay. Thank you. Thank you so much to, for every, to everyone who has uh, stuck it out for the last uh, couple of hours uh, listening to pitches. I'm sure many of you startups who are here. Uh, congratulations once again to everyone. We'll continue staying in touch and probably share a framework of sorts to to continue on on what we have been working with you on the, the venture bootcamp but also more importantly uh, that you have had a first hand experience of uh, seeing what kind of programming we run what kind of uh, things we bring to the table uh, like jagruti mentioned you definitely should look us up on the couple of uh, programs that have been announced today the website is fairly uh, explanatory in terms of uh, what kind of companies we are looking for and what kind of uh, structure the program has you you can apply but uh, importantly if you know people in your network for entrepreneurs founders who are looking at uh, getting this kind of support please feel free to to direct them to, to jagruti or paul or just ask them to go to the website and, and apply tell them that we are good people we are friends and we are here to encourage uh, budding entrepreneurs to kind of uh, build ventures at scale and bring our collective experience and network to the table and and help grow the ecosystem so we are here as a collaborator we are here as an enabler and that is what uh, we would want to do over the next few years. So thank you so much and have a wonderful Friday evening and, uh, and a great weekend. Thank you so much.